Hi there. So in this video, I wanted to dive more deeply into the chemistry aspects of the research we're doing in the Patterns of Mechanisms curriculum. So the main idea about this new curriculum that we've implemented a few years ago in the Department of Chemistry and Biomolecular Sciences at the University of Ottawa, is that we want to equip students to sort by deeper patterns and principles, rather than the surface level features that we often see them doing. The thing that ha often happens in chemistry is that students try to memorize all the different pages of the textbook, just the very surface level, just to get by. And so they end up making themselves um, images, decision trees, graphs that can look like this, just to get themselves through, and, and then they forget after the exam, which has the implications that they may not realize, and they often don't realize, then the implications of, of molecules, of chemistry, on vaccines and vaccine safety. They can't apply their knowledge towards local, or all the way up to international uh, issues, like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So by redesigning the curriculum by patterns and principles, rather than by the, the surface level, so rather than by what the molecules are, but rather by what they do and the connected nature of what they do, we hope that students will be better able to interpret, analyze, predict reactivity, transfer or use their knowledge in new contexts. We want to challenge that assumption. That's what we're doing through our research. So the curriculum starts with the regular structure property relationships that most organic chemistry curricula do. And then in the first year semester of first semester of organic chemistry, we get into acid base reactions, um, reactions, simple reactions of nucleophiles and pi electrophiles, then pi nucleophiles and electrophiles, and then the, the aromatic pi nucleophiles and electrophiles. Second semester then is where we see the more complex um, reactions of the uh, sigma electrophiles, which on the surface are very simple functional groups, but can undergo competing reaction mechanisms. And so this is where we see the SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 reactions, um, as well as oxidation reactions, um, because their main step uh, goes through essentially an E2 process. We then do structure determination through NMR and infrared. And then the second semester of Organic 2 wraps up by linking back to earlier patterns and, and just adding to them and, and knitting in some new ideas. So that would be, for example, the pi electrophiles with leaving groups, the carboxylic acids and analogs, as well as the acetals and analogs. Um, and then into sort of the souped up pi nucleophiles, which would include enol, enolate, and analog chemistry and reacting with electrophiles that at this point, the students have seen throughout the course. So this is the main idea, and we wanted to, to understand how students were organizing their knowledge, given that the curriculum was organizing it, we organized in the curriculum this way, but we also wanted to better understand how experts in the field organize their knowledge. We've organized the curriculum with the assumption that experts think about chemistry this way, but we haven't put that to the test yet. So here is the approach we took. We started out um, with this research, uh, developing reaction cards and each reaction we ask students to sort into students and professors to sort into categories. So in the first stage, we would ask them to sort however they wanted. And so we had uh, 25 reaction cards. They started out with 15 and then got an additional 10. And they could sort however they wanted. And we asked them to uh, label their categories and explain how they came up with their categories. In a second phase, we asked them to sort by mechanistic patterns. So it was Kelly and Minwa who looked at the first stage of the of the investigations that we did, and so they did this um, through an interview setting, looking uh, working with Organic Chemistry two participants as well as uh, masters and PhD students um, and professors, and then Keith took on the project and he moved it to an electronic platform where he had uh, over a hundred participants in different uh, iterations of this data collection, uh, and we'll look at some of the results. So the first thing we wanted to do was to identify some common sorting patterns from the participants. So what you're looking at here, each node or circle um, represents a label from one of the reaction cards. Um, and then the lines in between them represents at least one iteration of students who have uh, put those two cards, two reactions into a category together. The thickness of the line is proportional to the number of participants who have put those cards in the same category. So for example, between F and M, only two participants put those, those reactions in the same category, whereas 11 participants put N and E in the same category, as shown by the thicker line. 
when we looked, we saw that uh, N and E are represented by the reactions shown on the left. We have AGJ, which is another sort of cluster of commonly uh, grouped together reactions. <clears throat> and then DKO was another group of commonly sorted reactions. So if you're watching this and you're an expert in organic chemistry, you already may have ideas about why the participants may have sorted these in, into categories. And you may also have ideas about whether or not you would have sorted them into the same categories or not. So here's a couple of things that we found when we looked across all of the participants. First thing that we found is that the organic chemistry two participants sorted these reactions in all different kinds of ways. As we move towards more seniority, the PhD and the professor started to sort in, in more similar kinds of ways. As we got into task two, where they incorporated even more cards, the ways of sorting became even more disparate and diverse. The other thing that we saw was the ways in which the undergraduate students at MSc sorted. The, the thinking that they had behind it was different from, generally speaking, from the ways that PhD students and professors sorted. Specifically, the undergraduate students and MSc students sorted more at the surface level, but what they saw in the structures versus the PhDs and professors who sorted more at the deeper process oriented kind of levels. So that surface level would be the features they saw, the functional groups they saw, or the properties, electronegative atoms. So those are the more static surface level kind of sorts that we saw of the undergraduate students and the master students. PhD students and, and professors sorted more by reaction type and mechanism, so getting more at the process oriented and deeper kind of thinking in the chemistry. What the molecules do, and not less so what they are. So we saw a distribution of the categories by participant. So as the organic chemistry's two students sorted primarily by properties of structure or type of, type of structure, um, and the PhDs and professors sorted more by type of reaction and type of mechanism. So we could also quantify um, how many of the categorizations were at that deeper level. And we looked at this between the early semester and the late semester. So it turns out that in early in the semester, only 42% of the cards were sorted into deeper categories in one aspect of our study. Later in the semester, that shifted towards 61%. So we do see a shifting in the deeper level organization of thinking towards the end of a semester. We also, though, wanted to think about what affects categorization. What led to those, those choices in categorization? Whether it's by in the chemistry sense, or if we're talking about foods and drinks, or colors of foods, or, or nutritious values of foods. What affects the ways that we might categorize um, different objects, or images, or reactions? Well, it could be by choice, certainly, how we choose to do it. Maybe just the context, how I feel like doing it right now maybe with our purpose. Um, if I'm really thirsty, I'm gonna probably choose a liquid um, over a solid, for example. As a chemist, I may be looking for particular natural products with uh, specific substructures. So that would be a way of sorting by what we see on the surface in order probably to get at some deeper reactivity. Um, and it's also based on our ability. The more we know about something, the more we can connect our knowledge in, in different ways. So we wanted to understand more about the student's ability in this case. Were they able to sort by those deeper and more connected kind of ways, or were they just not able to? And that's why we were seeing them sort primarily by surface features. So what we saw was when we asked them to sort by these deeper processes, specifically by reaction mechanisms, early in the semester, we saw scores of only 20, the average score was only 23%. So their ability level was really low. Late in the semester, we did see that ability score uh, increase, so their ability to sort those reactions into mechanistic categories increased over the semester. Still not fantastic. Um, another way to see this, we, we separated this into organic one reactions and organic two reactions, so first and second semester chemistry. And what you're looking at here is their scores laid out on that x-axis um, from the early semester results, where that average was 23%. Now, if there had been no change, what we would have seen late semester was those scores lining up along the y equals x axis. What we saw, though, was that their scores did increase late in the semester, for the most part, um, with an average late semester score, like I said, of 45%. We also noticed, though, that those late semester scores were even higher for the organic one reactions than the organic two reactions. And that may be just longer time to get familiar with those reactions and the way those processes worked. 
So knowing that this ability to sort by mechanism or by deeper process could be desirable for interpreting existing reactions, predicting future reactions, or translating to other contexts, and knowing that students can gain expertise in it, um, it then becomes important to know how to incorporate these ideas into a classroom setting. So here are a couple of ideas about how these kinds of questions and how we can help students develop the skills in organizing their thinking by patterns of mechanism, developing that mechanistic thinking. So one way we can do it is to ask students but, um, to categorize reactions. So they can be given a reaction like the one shown at the bottom and asked to decide which category it fits into. And what we generally suggest is that um, students only use category A if it's the, the acid base, if it's the only thing happening in the reaction. Okay, so that can be expanded to a number of different reactions and even asking these in a, in a classroom setting brings up all sorts of great discussions about reactivity and mechanisms. You could also ask students to look at different mechanisms and identify analogous mechanistic steps. So even though the atoms look different, the steps may look different. Um, one may be under basic conditions, the other under acidic conditions. What are the parallels and similarities between these different reactions? And so they might see the collision between the nucleophile and electrophile as being one constant um, between the two and see how those are similar in their bond forming processes. Then they might compare how a, a deprotonation, a protonation step just serves to activate the nucleophile or electrophile. You can also ask them to take that further then to compare the differences. Compare the nucleophiles, compare the electrophiles, um, compare activation energies, etc. So the main idea here is that we've redesigned the organic chemistry curriculum to try to equip students to sort by deeper patterns and principles. And we do see experts sorting more by reactions and mechanisms. We do see that our results are not maybe not as good as we hoped they would be early on, but we're looking at ways to help students build those skills um, so they can really become uh, better equipped, not only with that knowledge, but also feel like more in control of what's happening in organic chemistry and have a better understanding of, of what's happening in the course rather than thinking about the course as a, a series of disconnected reactions that they just have to memorize for the exam. So I'm hopeful about where this is going.